Right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, our division's grand rounds today. My name is Esteban Franco, I'm the program director for the Geriatrics Fellowship, and I have the honor of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Danielle Rosen. She attended the University of Miami, where she completed a degree in psychology and chemistry in 2009. She received her master's in public health in 2011 and a medical degree from St. George University in 2015. Dr. Rosen completed her internal medicine residency in June of 2018 at Roger Williams Medical Center in Boston University. Dr. Rosen has a strong interest in geriatric medicine and throughout her medical training with special focus in biopsychosocial support for the geriatric patient as well as uh, caretaker burden. She has clinical research and experience in quality improvement in nursing home, public health policy, and community outreach. This summer, she will be joining the Iora Health um, at uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, where she will be the medical director of their geriatric medicine practice. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Franco. As you said, my name is Danielle. I'm one of the geriatrics fellows. Thank you all for joining me this morning. So today, let's talk about sex. We're going to be talking about intimacy, barriers, and ethical considerations for the older adult. As Dr. Franco mentioned, I received my degree in psychology at the University of Miami. And in 2007, I took a course on uh, sexuality and health. And I remember the professor saying to everyone, if your grandparents are still walking, they're still having sex. <laughs> and there was this like collective groan in the audience about how this was kind of icky and a little bit taboo. And unfortunately, while I think times have changed a little bit, I think there is still a lot of stigma around this topic. Um, even when I mentioned that I would be speaking of this, I received a few, you know, eye-raising comments and looks. So I think it's something that's definitely interesting to speak about today. So our objectives for today, we're going to examine age sexuality and some commonly associated myths. We're going to review sexual dysfunction in aging and recognize some ethical considerations in dementia. I have no financial relationships with any industry pertaining to this presentation. So I'd like to pose some questions for you to consider um, as we go throughout this presentation. While I think you might have an answer now, I would like to see if that answer changes by the end of the presentation or even really how you think about these questions might change. So sexuality is typically a lifelong need. True or false? Sexuality in older adults is dangerous to their health. It increases the risk of myocardial infarction. There is an inevitable loss of sexual satisfaction in postmenopausal women. True or false? And males and females may maintain sexual interest and activity well into their 90s. True or false? So I'm gonna start with a case. I'm going to be talking about Mr. and Mrs. D. I first met this couple in October 2018 in our clinic. It's a 76-year-old male and a 74-year-old female, and they've been married for 52 years. Um, they met while they were both obtaining their PhDs at a very highly regarded institute in the Northeast. They shared desks together while they were obtaining their graduate degrees, and then they worked together throughout their career and shared an office. Uh, very, very much in love. They were extremely successful, uh, traveled the world together. And one thing that they said to me, this was the first time I met them, they stated that they remained sexually active, and this was described as an integral component of their relationship. So this is a case that I'll be presenting as we go throughout the presentation, and I think it's gonna highlight some of the potential obstacles we might face as clinicians when we encounter the older adult and we talk about sexuality and sexual health. So for our very first objective um, that we're going to cover, let's take a closer examination of age sexuality and some of the myths that we associate with this. So if I were to ask you what sexuality is, I think most of you would be able to give me a definition. Um, we have an idea of what it is, but it's a little bit more difficult to very specifically define. So we can broadly define it as a dynamic outcome of physical capacity, motivation, 
attitudes and the opportunity for partnership and sexual conduct. It's extremely multidimensional and it encompasses our desires, emotions, actions, and behaviors. And what we associate sexuality with is a connection and contentment to not only ourselves, but to others as well. And in the 2014, the World Association of Sexual Health had a declaration of sexual rights and they stated sexuality is grounded in universal human rights and it's a central aspect of being human throughout our lifetime. So sexual health is important to individuals and their self-identity and general well-being, but this is really often ignored in the older adult. And the beliefs and misconceptions that are older adult uh, sexuality results in this attitude that the topic is not worth exploring. So here's a really good example. When we look at the wellness exams for adolescents or adults, we're required to take a very specific sexual history. You're required to ask about amount of sexual partners, if you're using protection, risky behaviors, what sex is the partner. So there is a lot of information that's required to go into the sexual health of the adolescent or adult patient. But now let's move on to the Medicare uh, mandica uh, mandated requirements. For an 85 year old female, we're required to ask her about her family history, which really might not be that relevant anymore. Um, we're required to ask about smoke detectors, weight loss, falls, but there is absolutely no requirement for a sexual history. So what does that say? Is this saying that this isn't important for us to discuss? Um, you know, it's really putting this out there that, you know, this is not a requirement. If I say what is age sexuality, we can say that this is considered to be a contradictory term. As I'll show forward, um, a growing body of research is demonstrating the relevance of sex and sexuality to older adults. Sexuality is important to the well-being and quality of life of people at any age, but the topic really remains understudied and infrequently discussed. So as we examine the data and we begin to understand uh, aging sexuality, one of the first questions we have is, so how many people are still having sex? Is it 0%? Is it 50%? Um, so what we can do is let's start with this New England Journal of Medicine study from 2007. It was a survey of about 3,000 community dwelling adults. They were aged 57 to 85. And this was sponsored by the National Social Life Health and Aging Project. And they really wanted to provide data on the sexual activity, behaviors, and problems of the older adults. They surveyed 100, um, 1,500 women and about 1,400 men in their homes from July 2005 to March 2016. And they wanted to know if you were sexually active. And they decided to define sexually active as a mutually voluntary activity with another person that involves sexual contact within the past 12 months. If you weren't sexually active, they then wanted to know why. And if you had a partner, they wanted to know if there were problems. And what this study found was is that aging itself didn't limit sexual longing or activity, but they did find a decrease in activity. If we look at a more recent study and we look at the University of Michigan National Poll on Healthy Aging from 2017, um, we wanted to look at perspectives on relationships and sex. So this was a sample of community dwelling adults as well and their age group was 65 to 80, and they were asked about their perspectives on relationships and sex and their experiences related to sexual health. And what this poll found was 76% of those polled agreed that sex is an important part of a romantic relationship at any age. They found that men were more likely to agree. This was 84% versus 69%. They found 40% of those polled indicated they were still sexually active and that they were more likely to be sexually active if there was a partner reported. So I would like to look at the data from these two studies like I stated. As you can see, the cohorts are a little bit different where the New England Journal of Medicine has a younger cohort, the 57 to 64, and then the Michigan survey from 2017 has this older cohort from 76 to 80. And what we find is um, the percentage of those reporting still having sex goes down with age, uh, with each age cohort. 
Um, but the percentage of people still reporting having sex in that 71 to 75 age group increased in 2005 to 2017 from 25% to 39%. So what we're finding is people really still are reporting that they're still having sex. And there is a little bit of, a, of an upswing now in the most uh, current data we have. And we can maybe hypothesize that this is due to the baby boomer generation. So sexual expression in any given society is then governed by the attitudes and norms of that society. And the baby boomer generation has been known to be more confident with expressing their sexuality as they age. So they've championed more liberal, liberal attitudes towards sex, sexuality, and relations than some previous generations. There's also been this medicalization of sexuality so that we now have an availability of drugs. We treat chronic conditions um, better than we have in the past. So the ability to remain sexually active has increased. And then times are changing as well. Like I stated from the previous study, you were more likely to have sex if you had a partner available. And we now live in the digital era. So having the avail availability of digital online sources might change sexuality in the future. So if we look at the uh, successful aging evaluation, this was a study out of UC San Diego Center for Healthy Aging. And they looked at community dwelling partner older adults, 50 to 99, and they surveyed them um, by phone about their sex health. And what I thought was really interesting about this survey is that they also performed cognitive screenings, they looked at physical function, and then they did screenings for depression as well as anxiety. And what this survey found was that depressive symptoms were very highly correlated with a lack of sexual activity. So for our uh, second objective today, we're going to review sexual dysfunction and aging. We're going to review some of the normal changes we would expect, and then some other changes that might arise as we age. So now back to Mr. and Mrs. D. When I started talking to them more, they had one joint chief complaint, and that was Mr. D's erectile dysfunction. They stated that they had a trial of sildenafil, and this offered them no benefit, and this was very, very distressful to them. They said they weren't able to have the, you know, the quality of the sexual activity that they were used to. It was reducing their quality of life, and they really wanted me to come up with a solution to help them. So when we look at normal aging, we know there's physical changes in both men and women and changes in hormone levels can affect sexual desire, response, and enjoyment. But if we understand this normal aging process, we can help target deficiencies and promote sexual health in older adults. In normal aging in females, this is really fundamentally shaped by the changes that occur with menopause. So starting from the perimenopausal period, we have a decline in female sex hormones. So we'll see a decline in estrogen to low levels, uh, progesterone will no longer be produced after menopause, and then testosterone will decrease as well, but it will continue to be produced in the postmenopausal period. And these changes in hormones will lead to atrophy of urogenital tissues, decrease in lubrication, and the changes in hormones will also lead to a decline in libido and sexual responsiveness. So these are some of the normal changes that we do expect to see as someone ages. When we look at normal aging in male sen, these changes are also linked to hormones, but it's really due to this de decline in testosterone production. So we know that testosterone levels will drop on average 1.6% per year, and a level below 8 will be associated with loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, and fatigue. And I found these percentages to be um, higher than I expected. By age 60, 20% of men will have low testosterone levels, but then this will rise to 50% in men over 80. And these are the patients that we really see on a daily basis, and we often don't touch on these things when we think about fatigue. We really don't think about testosterone levels. It's really tested. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Um, so as I said, um, normal aging and sexual dysfunction is a multifactorial process, but there are issues that arise that are more than we'd expect with normal aging. 
So when we look at chronic medical conditions, we know that 80% of adults over 65 will have at least one chronic medical condition. And over the age, um, and then 68% of older adults will have greater than two chronic medical conditions. So if we look at primary causes of sexual dysfunction, these will really be any illness that impairs blood supply or nervous innervation. So the two main ones are diabetic neuropathy and peripheral vascular disease. And then we look at some secondary causes of sexual dysfunction. We can think about fatigue, which we can see in our COPD patients, in our congestive heart failure patients. We can think about pain. Um, this we can see in our osteoarthritis patients or our cancer patients. And then physical disabilities, so someone who has had a stroke or a fracture or someone with Parkinson's disease. A little bit about diabetes and sexual dysfunction. Uh, diabetes affects approximately 10.9 million older adults. It's a very big problem in the geriatric population. And 42% of those with diabetes are over the age of 65. And diabetes can impact uh, multiple different areas of sexual health, including sexual function, arousal, and then pleasurable sensations. And it's reported that up to 50% of men and 25% of women may experience some kind of sexual problem or loss of sexual desire associated with diabetes. So as we go through this multifactorial process of sexual dysfunction, I'd like to briefly touch on some of our classic geriatric syndromes um, that are very interconnected with sexual health. So a big one is urinary incontinence. And um, shockingly, the relationship between urinary incontinence and sexual health is really not well studied. There was a 2006 study, though, done by Tenenbaum, where he looked at 2,300 community-dwelling older adults, 55 to 95 years old. And what they found was urinary incontinence was significantly associated with alterations in sexual health. And it was theorized that this was due to shame and embarrassment or just complete avoidance of sexual activity due to fear of incontinence. Sexual dysfunction in older adults is often very comorbid with psychiatric illnesses and depression is a really major factor in this. So when we look at, uh, at baseline, 40 to 50% of individuals with depression will experience a loss of sexual desire as a cardinal symptom. And then when we look treat our patients, nearly 60% of older adults using SSRIs report sexual dysfunction. So really depression affects sexual health from two ways. One just says the nature of the illness in itself, and then when we go to treat it. Polypharmacy also continues to be a big problem in the geriatric population, and this is just a small list of medications commonly prescribed to our patients that can contribute to sexual dysfunction. So we have the very commonly prescribed antihypertensives like our beta blockers and diuretics, antiandrogens, antihistamines, and then psychotropic medications that frequently a lot of our patients are taking. So these include the antipsychotics, antidepressants, alcohol consumption, and then anti-epileptics as well. And patients might discontinue needed medications because of side effects that lead, lead to this sexual dysfunction, and then they might be too embarrassed to tell us. We might not realize why patients stop taking their medications. So really it comes on us as the providers to probe why people stop taking them. When we think about major life stressors, we know, we know that these can, can, can occur at any age, but they really begin to pile up as one becomes an older adult. Certain initial episodes of sexual dysfunction are often precipitated by a major psychosocial stress. So a major one is the loss of a loved one. This can lead to many different things. One is just having the lack of a partner. Another is survivor guilt. And then there could be difficulty moving on. We could look at some specific medical crises like having a heart attack, this can lead to some performance anxiety. This can lead to fear of pain and therefore avoidance. And then prolonged illnesses or hospitalizations like pneumonia or having a fracture can lead to deconditioning and weakness, which can make us functionally impaired when it comes to performance. So these specific psychosocial stresses might break sexual patterns and then lead to uncertainty on how to resume sexual activity. 
When we think about self-image in the older adults, there's an altered perception of self-image as we age. And we can say that we feel like we don't look like ourselves anymore. And this might sound really superficial, but why should we stop caring about how we look when we get older? And I think a lot of us you know, can reflect and say, we've had a patient who refuses to use a cane or a walker. And when you ask them why, they say it's because they don't wanna look old. So we've encountered it on, the, on the, you know, a frequent basis that people are concerned with how they look. And physical changes in appearance can be very distressing to the older adult. So some of the things that we expect are the scanning of wrinkling skin, and then patients who have mastectomies or colostomy bags or surgical scars can really have you know, some impairment in their self-image. When we think about the barriers that contribute to sexual health and sexual dysfunction, it's important to think about the barriers that prevent patients from seeking help. And one is that patients might mistakenly attribute some of these concerns to normal aging, which there is some normal aging, but it's not all normal. Um, there can be some embarrassment and fear. There could be a lack of knowledge about services that are available. And then they might perceive us as having negative attitudes towards sex in later life, which can lead to avoidance. A 2003 study by Gott that looked at the barriers to seeking help and treatment for sexual dysfunction found that 97% of adults would prefer a physician to bring this up and they would be interested in talking about sexual health and sexual dysfunction. And they were actually even willing to come back for a second visit. So it is something that patients are interested in. So how comfortable are patients discussing sexual problems with physicians? There was a 2013 study on sexual activity and aging, and they found that less than 5% of women offered up their sexual dysfunction problems. But when they were probed by uh, physicians, 20% of them did bring up their issues when asked. So this is a 15% increase in discussing sexual problems. But us as geriatricians, we are failing as well. There was a study that looked at 120 geriatricians and they found that only 50% of them asked about sexual health when 97% of them told, thought that this was important and something that should be discussed. So while we might think it's important, we're really not following through um, with how we feel. So healthcare providers should introduce sexual topics by asking whether there are any difficulties with intimacy. And some specific examples of language we can use can be, what changes in physical intimacy have you experienced as you've grown older? What goals do you have for yourself when it comes to your intimate relationships? So those are some physician barriers. So now let's look at some location barriers. Over 2 million older adults live in nursing homes or assisted living facilities. And the medical model really prevails in these settings. Um, there is an emphasis on safety and physical care over the psychosocial needs of the residents. And as I'm going to show you going forward with a few studies, there are equal levels of sexual desire between older adults who reside in and out of aged care. <laughs> And for many residents in aged care facilities, both with and without dementia, they report that sexuality still matters. What they did find was this interest is acted upon much less frequently. And when we go through some of these location barriers, you can really see why this might be so. <clears throat> so a literature review looked at older adults in nursing home settings, and they found that a majority of nursing home residents stated sexuality is at least of moderate importance. But they then placed a significant value on a range of sexual activities. So this included fantasy, holding hands, hugging, kissing, intercourse, and pornography. So the sexual desires did vary, but it still was of at least moderate uh, importance. And they found that the sexual desire really was similar to community dwelling older adults. This was a study done in Australia. It was published in the Journal of Aging Studies in 2015. And they looked at 19 aged care staff members and 23 residents. And they did focus groups and interviews. So the ratio of the staff were 18 females and one male. And then the residents were 15 females and eight males. And what they found was is the staff said, sexual expression is a need to be met. 
resonant said, sexual expression is a right to be exercised. So as you can see, the conflict between how sexual expression is looked upon um, really varies within the nursing home or assisted living setting between the residents and the staff members. There are certain barriers in the nursing home that create a problem with sexual expression. There's a lack of physical privacy. There's a lack of privacy of information. So you can imagine when you're in a nursing home, often someone will come up and try to take a history with someone in a communal setting. Um, doesn't really offer a lot of privacy. There's negative attitudes uh, from the staff and there's a lack of training when it comes to sexual issues in the nursing home. And then there's this focus on safety and physical care needs. So when we look at nursing homes specifically, they're structured as an open public space. And this is partially because it's made for easy access and facilitating patient observation. So often there's a central nursing station or central station and then rooms are kind of centered around and very communal settings where it's easy to observe your, your residents. Doors are often not lockable and then they're often entered without knocking. And then lounges and dining rooms are communal areas. So I want you to think about yourself and I want you to think about how comfortable you would be going on a dinner date in this communal setting. Or if you're watching a movie on you know, the mutual uh, TV, are you gonna handhold with someone in front of this entire group? You know, so it really creates a lack of privacy and a lack of intimacy. So back to that 2015 Australian study, one of the people surveyed was an 83 year old female named Diane. And she was being assisted with her shower and a nurse announced that the doctor was there to see her and asked if he could come in. And she said, certainly not. Either they can come back later or I'll see them next week. I was highly incensed. You're always telling me this is my home. If I were at home, there would be no way that I would entertain a doctor while I was in the shower. So I'd like to ask you, how many of you are guilty of doing this? How often do we go into a patient's room when they're still on a bedpan? Or they're being changed by nursing and their gown's not completely closed? And then I want you to think, do we think twice about this in the older adult versus maybe our 40-year-old patient? Do we feel more comfortable going in the room of the older adult who's exposed than a younger patient? And why is that? When we look at guidelines and staffing in the nursing home, we know that all facilities do have policies, but when we look at um, a 2015 study of 366 directors of nursing, they found that a majority, which was 63% of facilities in their policies, they didn't address any aspect of resident sexuality. 11% of these actually required a physician order to allow sexual activity. So in order for you to engage in any sort of sexual activity, you, know, you needed a doctor's note. So, <laughs> Without guidelines, staff have a very difficult time meeting these differing needs and expectations of residents and their families as well. But studies have shown that educational interventions will positively influence uh, the nursing staff's attitudes and their com comfort factor when it comes to sexuality in the nursing home. Now let's move on to some ethical considerations in the dementia patient. There are more than 16 million Americans living with neurocognitive impairment. And this is strikingly uh, twice the amount of the population of New York City, which is the you know, most populated city in the United States. And age is one of the greatest risk factors. So as this baby boomer generation is surpassing the age of 65, the number of those with cognitive impairment can increase dramatically. So, Back in the 1990s, the first early recommendation suggested that anyone with moderate to severe dementia, they were automatically precluded from being able to consent to sexual activity. Um, times have changed a little bit, but the primary ethical issue is still to balance the rights to autonomy and privacy, and then our duty to protect our vulnerable patients from harm. So while we think now that the presence, uh, presence of cognitive impairment indicates the need for a more extensive cognitive evaluation, um, this isn't really the only factor we should consider when looking at uh, ability to consent to sexual activity. But we should highlight um, the presence of impairment when it comes to executive function because 
these are our abilities to plan, problem solve, and make decisions. So this is really an important factor when it comes to your ability to consent. So back to Mr. and Mrs. D. When I went through and did a little more history taking, Mr. D suffered from Parkinson's, depression, and coronary artery disease. And Mrs. D had hypertension and neurocognitive impairment. I performed a slums on them, and this is the St. Louis University mental status examination. It's a screening tool for dementia, and it's an alternative to the mini mental exam. It's been validated in the VA setting, and it's very similar to a MOCA, where it assesses multiple cognitive domains. It's been found to be a better predictor of mild cognitive impairment than the mini mental exam. And it's scored on a range of 0 to 30, where 27 to 30 is considered uh, normal cognitive function, 21 to 26 is mild cognitive impairment, and 0 to 20 is dementia. And if you have less than a high school education, you actually gain a point on this scale. So now we have Mrs. D, and she has a slums of 15 out of 30. She had deficits in delayed recall, visual, spatial, and executive function. And if you remember from what I told you from the beginning of this presentation, she has her PhD, and she's very highly educated. So this 15 out of 30 is pretty significant. So the sexual expression in the context of dementia is a highly controversial topic, and it makes a lot of us uneasy, and it raises a variety of ethical concerns. When we review the literature, right now it's saying that the resident's capability to consent is really the predominating factor when you assess whether or not it's morally permissible to engage in sexual activity. So there's this very strong focus on cognitive capacity, which really disregards sexual longings of patients with dementia. And it really fails to give an accurate picture to what human sexuality entails, whether someone has capacity, is competent or not. So at the time of this trial, Henry Rayons was a 78-year-old male. This trial took place in 2014. He was a retired farmer and former state legislator. And he was charged with sexually abusing his wife, Donna, who had dementia. This was a second marriage for both of them. They had been married for seven years. And he was accused by daughters from Donna's first marriage of having sex with a woman doctors stated no longer had the ability to consent. So he was arrested and charged with sexual abuse in the third degree. He stated that they only held hands and kissed within the nursing home setting. And she was brought to the hospital and a rape kit was performed. And they found that there was no sexual penetration on Donna. He was found to be not guilty by the court, but it was very unclear as to why he was not guilty. They're not sure if they felt that Donna had the ability to consent to these activities or if there was just not enough evidence to determine whether or not he had sexually assaulted his wife. So the New York Times then placed an article stating sex and dementia and a husband on trial at age 78. And there were a lot of comments written about this article. So then they went and decided to examine the comments, and they looked at almost 1,200 comments. And what they wanted to analyze was the public view of sexual consent in the context of dementia. And what they found was 68.3% uh, were for sex for individuals with dementia, and 31.7% were against sex for individuals with dementia. So as you can see, while a majority were for this behavior, it's, it wasn't a landslide. So it's very controversial. So when we look at the capacity in the context of sexual activity, we want to look at some hallmark things that really define capacity. So that is, can the older adult communicate choice? Can they communicate understanding of this choice? Can they communicate appreciation of potential consequence of the choice? And can they communicate reasoning and rationale of the choice? Um, and then one of the hallmarks then that differs regular capacity from capacity in the context of sexual activity is can they set limits and can they say no? Do they feel comfortable and have the ability to set these limits? We want to know if the integrity of these decisions should be integrated with the person's previous values. And then something that we normally look at with capacity is we want to look at consistency with decision making. And this is very hard when it comes to sexual activity. 
when we think about someone where we want to withdraw life-sustaining treatment or someone who no longer wants to continue with a chemotherapy or a dialysis, we want to look at consistency of their decision to determine whether or not they have capacity. But how do we do that with sexual activity? Are you supposed to always be consistent with your decisions from a day-to-day -day basis on whether or not you want to engage in sexual activity? So, I mean, this is very, very difficult. So, sexual engagement is often not a strictly decision-making activity. In this 2017 study, there was a quote that I really liked that said, sex is not a decision most confident people make after carefully weighing the pros and cons or the biological implications of their decisions. <laughs> then why is decision-making capacity the only or even primary standard for evaluating if the sexual behavior is acceptable? <clears throat> so there are no universal guidelines to determine an older adult's sexual consent capacity, but there were some recommendations put forth by the American Psychological Association and the American Bar Association. And what they wanted to do was three things. They wanted to evaluate a patient's knowledge, reasoning, and voluntariness. And they felt that these three criteria were the underlying conceptual framework for sexual consent capacity. They wanted to use an interdisciplinary committee or team, so this can include uh, physicians, PT, OT, social workers. And then they wanted to evaluate family dynamics, environmental constraints, legal rights, staff attitudes, and then this overarching stigma, which we've been touching on with sexual activity in the older adult. So disinhibition is found in 30 to 60% of dementia cases, and is one of the most disruptive neuropsychiatric symptoms reported by family and caretakers. It's very burdensome, and it uh, presents with a lot of high caregiver stress. And reports have shown, though, that screening for disinhibition is not highly sensitive for detecting sexual disinhibition. So therefore, inappropriate sexual behavior is often understudied. There are a few hypotheses that were put forward looking at frontal lobe dysfunction and this um, altering the inhibitory mechanisms, and then temporal lobe dysfunction causing problems with regarding emotional and intellectual interpretations of sexual activity. So it is inappropriate sexual behavior, and how do we define this? We often think of this as hypersexuality, lewd behavior, those really inappropriate explicit talks or comments to people, um, but it can actually also be appropriate behavior in inappropriate settings. So you can think of someone who's fondling themselves in public or exposing themselves in public. Sometimes the behaviors in themselves are actually normal, but in the setting, they're inappropriate. <laughs> So it becomes very difficult to assess how common it is. Um, most studies are showing this giant range of 1% to 25% to the 17%. And there are multiple reasons why there's so many inconsistencies. Like I said, it could be due to who is viewing these inconsistencies and our own bias of what we think is appropriate or inappropriate. And then it could be due to the different relationships between the caregiver and the care recipient. So will a wife or a husband think there's inappropriate sexual behavior in different you know, frequencies than a VNA or a child? So this really could skew the data. It makes it diff uh, difficult to interpret. When we think about conflict, we can think that it may emerge when a patient's desires for autonomy and institutional and family concerns about safety and practical considerations come head to head. Um, decision makers can wind up being children and they might have to, you know, consent to their parents engaging in sexual activity. And this can cause a lot of embarrassment. It can cause anger. Children can feel betrayed. So they're unable to separate their own views about parents' relationship status from current or past behavior. And this has been seen sometimes where there's a couple and one of them has um, cognitive impairment and are in a facility. And they no longer have any memories of their living spouse at home. And they'll have a relationship with someone in the facility, which is really a healthy and normal relationship. But it's very distressing to the family who feels that this partner is cheating on their mom or dad. 
So often what this can do is, this can lead to a very restrictive stance where we just say no activity. So then we don't really need to address the subject. I would like to touch on the LGBTQ community because I feel this is really significant with this topic. Um, by the year 2030, the literature is stating that the number of lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender adults aged 65 or older in the U.S. is estimated to reach between 2 to 6 million. And I feel like this is an underestimation of this number. And older adults are already a marginalized community. And then this is, you know, a further subset of marginalized individuals. So they experience significant health disparities relating to aging, especially with aging sexuality. <laughs> and something that I found to be um, shocking and upsetting and that should be focused on more is up to 80% of LGBTQ older adults will wind up hiding their orientation when they move into a long-term care facility. So, you know, this is really impactful and something that is um, minimally researched and there's not a lot of information on. So going forward, it should be something that's, you know, talked about and, and researched more. So going forward, how do we redefine sexuality and intimacy in the older adult? I think we can all say that being worthy of human touch is important. And I would like you to consider the older, more frail patient who receives touch largely for the purpose of care. So think of the patient who is living in a thin gown or pajamas. They often have socks that are too big on their feet. We touch them through gloves. We go in their room in a gown through, you know, protective equipment. Everything we're saying is there needs to be a barrier between us and you. We turn them to wipe them with ADL care and often, you know, not gentle, not patient. And it's, you know, that is the only human touch that these older adults might experience. So we should put more thought into this. And what they found is when they looked at um, spousal interviews is that later life intimacy, such as cuddling and affection, rather than sexual activity, was emphasized as a basic human need. So sometimes we're really not providing our patients or older adults or restricting them from basic human needs. I think there's a large role for occupational therapists when it comes to this topic. Um, the hallmark of OT is actually engagement in the most meaningful activities of daily living. So they often help with activities um, which are acts of intimate care, toileting, bathing, dressing. So there's a great future opportunity to address the topic of intimacy and sexuality goals and desires for patients with our therapists. So what happened to Mr. and Mrs. D? He was really easy. I started him on Tadafinil and they were very, very happy with the results. So he was the easy part. She was difficult. We actually wound up having an IDT to discuss her and we really performed the sexual capacity um, decision-making evaluation that I didn't realize we were doing at the time. So in the room there was physicians, social workers, case managers, and nursing. And we decided that her desires were consistent with previous beliefs. There was a mutual initiation of behavior, and we felt she was able to understand the relationship and had the ability to say no. So we thought she did have the capacity to engage in this behavior, and more importantly, we thought Mr. D understood her limitations, so we didn't have a fear that he would take advantage of her. But if I were to introduce you to Mrs. D, you would see that she really is quite impaired. Um, and while this behavior right now is healthy, this might change in the future. So that's why we really did put a lot of thought into this couple because we wanted to improve their quality of life and we didn't want to restrict them. But as you can see, it's not so cut and dry. So true or false, sexuality is typically a lifelong need. I think we could say the answer is true. Sexual activity in older adults is dangerous to their health, false, and increases the risk of myocardial infarction, false. There is an inevitable loss of sexual satisfaction in postmenopausal women, false. And males and females may maintain sexual interest and activity well into their 90s, true. So what is the takeaway here? 
Sexuality is important to the well-being and quality of life of people at any age. And while the emphasis on what is most important might change as we age, the importance of human touch and affection does not. So I would like to give a very special thank you to Drs. Aaron Scott and Aaron Stevens. Um, they provided me with a generous amount of time and support, not just with this presentation, but throughout this year. They are everything that mentors should be. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Danielle, for this very interesting presentation. I'd like to open up uh, for any questions. Okay, yeah, of course. So, uh, two questions. Um, one, you mentioned depression is associated with lack of um, sexual satisfaction, but uh, there's always this concern with SSRIs that it can decrease libido and at least uh, in male patients that seems to be a legal reluctance to use to get their depression treatment. That's the first question. Second is um, uh, meds for erectile dysfunction in patients with cardiovascular disease. You decide what's sure. So the question posed was looking at depression and how it decreases loss of libido, but then SSRIs also decrease libido, especially in men. That was the first part. So um, I think, you know, taking a careful history um, and seeing if the loss of libido was the presenting complaint with depression, or is it a medication side effect? Because we do know mirtazapine, for example, um, for depression, it does cause less sexual dysfunction. So I think it's more of a trial and error and speaking with your patient. And then the second question posed was looking at medications for erectile dysfunction and the risk with cardiovascular disease. And this was actually interesting because I had this with Mr. D, where he was hospitalized for a, a presyncope event, and they discontinued his newly started tovaphanil. And the day he was discharged, I received a very, very angry <laughs> message, um, very angry message saying, you know, this is unacceptable. And I think then it comes down to quality of life and informed consent and risking the benefits and looking at the, you know, risks and benefits and what is most important to our patients. And I think for him, I, I re-prescribed it. You know, he understood some of the risks and I felt like the quality of life for him was more important to continue the medication. Absolutely. So this question was asking um, for someone who works with older adults who ask um, about sexuality and the patient can sometimes say, oh, I don't think this is important. It's, you know, do they really feel this way or are we not addressing it? And I think, you know, the studies have shown it's, it's our job to bring it up as physicians and to normalize things and make people feel comfortable because you're right, it could be a defense mechanism or they might not think that there are any solutions for some problems that they're experiencing. You know, someone with severe vaginal atrophy can have a lot of pain with sex, so they might not think it's important anymore. And they might not realize there are medical advances and there are things that we can do to combat some of the problems that, you know, we have with normal aging and dysfunction. So I think, you know, it's our job to just keep chatting. Yes. Uh, so I have a comment and a question. Um, the, you cited the Aaron Metz, this interesting article, and I, um, for those of you uh, who don't know, I said she was interested. Um, you talk about sexuality, you know, if you're going and, and asking you to decision making, it's a skill, right? You're going to have like a heart surgery or chemo or something. That's a different standard. It requires a higher standard of decision. Asking them, then um, lowering the symptoms, it's more like deciding whether you want to get a little chocolate. <laughs> then, then, you know, there's my, I, I, I think that that is true. I, I, I love the way you said that. 
the other thing is that some of the ones that have been asking many questions about what we do have in the thing is there's so much, there's such a comprehensive, such a comprehensive conversation is that um, a lot of the nursing and long-term care facilities are staffed by people from other countries, uh, other ethnicities, hyper religious, uh, mm -hmm. which is very important. And they do come with their own views about what's proper and not proper. And uh, especially around LGBTQ stuff, also, which I appreciate that we've addressed because it's become more of an issue. I, I think there's a real um, need for education for those populations. Absolutely. And I wonder if you can come across something. So this question was looking at um, staff in nursing homes, which come with their own kind of bias. They could be from other countries. They can have religious preferences. So is there any- other countries, it's Indiana, for example. Yes, very true. <laughs> yes. Um, so this was asking, is there a way to help with um, staff training? I did find a study, I'm not sure what it was called, but they had, the, it was like a quiz that they did and they had a fun little trivia game. But what they did find is with staff education, they were more receptive to the sexual rights and needs of patients living in nursing homes and assisted livings. I mean, we do tell them that these are their homes. So if a nurse walks into a patient's room and they're masturbating, that's very uncomfortable, but that's not inappropriate behavior. Um, and it might be deemed as inappropriate. So I think it's just keeping the conversation alive and just re-education and showing what is normal. And I think having these talks helps normalize things. Any questions from the remote location? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.